Special to me, uh, Logan and uh, and uh, uh, Logan is a senior at UNT. He's majored in, made, uh, in music uh, his entire life. And, uh, and I, I had the pl privilege of meeting Logan his freshman year uh, in college there at UNT, uh, one of the last years that we got to spend with our time there. Um, but he's also, not only is he graduating in May, but he's also getting married in May. Uh, uh, to someone very familiar to the church, and that's Nikki. Uh, and uh, Nikki uh, sacrificed a year of her life, jumped out of Texas, and it's strong borders there uh, to help build up the church here. So we're super grateful for Nikki, uh, the time that she's had there. Uh, but now they're engaged to be married. Uh, he's going to graduate and uh, just... Everything happily ever after, right? Amen. But I want to introduce Logan as he's going to share his testimony for us. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Oklahoma Church. Uh, like Ben said, my name is Logan Agarta. Uh, I'm probably more known as Nikki's fiance here. Um, but I just want—I want to start by saying, uh, man, we are just so blessed uh, to have such a big family of churches. And so uh, it's just been really encouraging for Dallas to just be able to come up here and just to see such an awesome, loving family of Christ here. And so we're very grateful just to be here with you guys this weekend. Um, but right now, I just want to kind of share my story with you guys. And so uh, growing up as a kid, uh, I grew up in like a religious household. Uh, I grew up going to a non-denominational Christian group, uh, just a church, just a bunch of old people. We just sang... Uh, hymns all the time, and nothing, we never spoke to anyone, but I was just there all the time, right, and uh, I grew up thinking that I was a Christian. Uh, I just was at church, and I was present, but there was uh, something missing. There was no personal relationship with God, and I didn't know that yet, but my relationship with God, it was purely outward, really, if I'm being honest, like everything was for show, and I even remember when I was 12 years old, I got baptized, um, when I, just because I just thought it was the right thing to do, like my parents were talking about it, I just, my family, I just knew it was something I needed to do, and I remember on the day of my baptism, I just didn't talk to anyone, I was just being dramatic, I was like a little teenager, I was just like, man, <laughs> my mom's like, what's wrong, are you okay, I'm like, no, no, this is my day. <laughs> this, is, this is good. It's, I'm peaceful today. You know, this is, this is my day. And uh, I didn't even really know what was going on, but I just knew I was getting in there. But to be honest, it was just a bath and a river. Uh, and there was no meaning or any spirituality behind it. But that was my life as a kid, right? It was just so selfish. And everything was about myself. And, you know, I started to realize this more when I came to college. And... Uh, I started getting away from uh, this life uh, with my parents, and anything God-related was just thrown out the window. I was practicing music six to eight hours a day. It was insane. And so I just got busy, and God just started to drift away more and more. But luckily, uh, I have a family member. My Uncle Paul uh, goes to church. Yeah, come on, Paul. He goes to church in uh, San Antonio. And so uh, I, even, I actually had gone there as a kid. Uh, to this church in, in San Antonio, uh, and I, I thought it was so weird. I was like, why are we meeting in a cafeteria? And I was like, it's so weird. Why are people yelling at the preacher? This is just, uh, this is weird. And, you know, and I, wasn't, well, I wasn't used to the culture, uh, but it was so good because uh, my Uncle Paul had got divorced with my aunt, and uh, my aunt was blood, so I haven't seen him in like a year. And so on my train on the way back to Denton, uh, he just calls me. He's like, yo, what's up? He just shoots me a text message. He's like, hey, call this phone number. I'm like, what? <laughs> okay. I was like, nice to, nice to see you again. You know, like, what, what's, how's, what's, how's it going? And uh, we caught up a little bit. But turns out uh, Ben Borland had gone to San Antonio uh, when he was at UNT. And he was like, hey, uh, I got a nephew, I think. He's like, I don't even really know, but I got a nephew at UNT. Uh, here's his phone number. And it just kind of. We got hooked up like from through my uncle. It's super weird, but awesome. And so I came out to a game night. I got to meet this really awesome old guy with kids. He's super nerdy, and uh, you know he, he came out and he had. Old guy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, but 
No, but but Ben Ben was so nice to me. Uh, he he asked me to go get lunch with him the next day and start talking about these Bible studies. And so I hopped on the train and slowly started to realize that my life was not with God and uh, how far apart it was from that. And so Ben was amazing. So with Ben and a few other guys, and I ended up getting baptized on March 5th in 2014. Amen. And man, it's been so encouraging, just my walk with God after that, because God is so good. Yeah. And um, I want to share a scripture that uh, has just always stood out to me, even when I, before I became a Christian and even today. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19, it says, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like the one under the law, though I am myself and not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I am not under Christ. But I am under Christ's law, so as to win those having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. And that's just reminded me that. I have a mission now, and it's just been so encouraging just to see God work through so many people and through my life and through everything Ben's done for us in uh, Denton, and it's just been encouraging, and, and guys, God is good, and I'm so grateful that we have something like this, and it's Amen. awesome, and so I love Ben and everyone else. Thank you. I'll try not to fall asleep on you up here. Uh, my kids age me. It's their fault. It's... Oh, yeah. even, even strangers on the street tell me that. So, um, and uh, so the title of my lesson today is "Experience Me." And uh, uh, Logan, great job sharing there. And uh, man, it's just so crazy to see transformation because I only got to be a part. I was a flat, you know, I'm, I was just a flash in the pan in Logan's life. I was only there for a year. Um, and then to now see him three years later, it, it's crazy to see how God works um, uh, just in that capacity. But, um, and I'm going to talk about this idea of uh, what it means to know God and for God to know you. And um, man, just... Anyway, I'm just going to say this. I love God's word, man. And I, I've been at this point where I've been, I've, I've been under the discipline where I've been working up, waking up at 530 for the last four weeks just to try and get more time in uh, with God and, and just more time in the word because I felt like I just wanted to keep reading. I wanted to keep reading, but I had so many things that had to be done in the day, right? And uh, so I think I'm four weeks now. Susan would know for sure. So, um, and, and so I might look tired to you because I'm, I'm not struggling to wake up in the morning. Uh, I'm struggling to go to bed earlier is, is more my challenge right now. So, uh, uh, but thank you. Um, um, uh, for a young 50-year-old like myself. So, and... Uh, but you can open up your Bibles to Matthew 7. But I'd like to address this question of why is it important to know God and for God to know you? And this was an important question for me when I was studying the Bible. And my background is I grew up in an atheist home. Uh, to know God was, not, was no priority. W what did really matter? Even when I was studying the Bible, I, I wanted to know the Bible, but not to know God. I just wanted to learn morals. I just wanted to add to my life, to better my life. And I thought, there's surely wisdom in this book. But my intention was not to know God. That was never a priority for me. Um, but it, it's extremely important to know God. And, and I think it should be one of our, our highest priorities. I think even Paul talks about trying to know Jesus to the Philippian church while he's in prison. He says, man, everything that was to a gain in my life that I boasted about is now a loss compared to that of knowing Christ. Yeah. Just to know him. Uh, this Philippians 3.10, he says, look, I want to know Christ and his sufferings and his affliction as if, as if I was attaining the resurrection myself. 
That was a freebie. It's not on the slide. So if you're looking for it, it's not hidden up there. I told you, I told you to go to Matthew 7. And, um, and this is my quiet times currently is I just took a pink highlighter and I went through the book of John. And if you're watching online, you're totally not going to see this at all. Um, and if you're Jason Touche, you probably won't be able to read it just because of your current eyesight. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I went through with the pink highlighter, and I just highlighted every time Jesus talked about him and his father in that relationship. And, and just every chapter is just laced in pink uh, with, with all these moments of him about me and the Father. I don't speak any words without the Father. I only do what the Father's told me to do. My food is to do my Father's will. Right. So it's a lot of these scriptures. And I like this moment in John 14. And this is my music reference. I feel like Jesus kind of crescendos. Oh, and, uh, you know, with this moment of, okay, here it is. We've had the Last Supper. He's washed the feet of the disciples here. And uh, and this is the last big speech before he gets arrested, beaten and dies on the cross. And, uh, you know, look at this inter- interaction from Thomas. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. So how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way. I am the truth and the life, right? No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. You know, it's just one of those things of, hey, because you've experienced me, right? Because I've walked with you. I've been with you. You know the father. You know him because you know me. And they're like, wait, okay, just run it past us one more time. How do we get to heaven? What's the way? How are we going to be with you for eternity again? And he goes, you already know it. You've already experienced the way. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. And, you know, from my atheist background, we like to study a lot of world religions and just throw them all into the same pot, like gumbo or something. But it doesn't taste as good. And, and, you know, it's just one of those things, but like Buddha doesn't say that he's the way. He's trying to show the way. Yeah, even in Islam, you know, Muhammad is, you know, just trying to show the way. Jesus isn't trying to show the way. He says, I am the way. Your experience with me, you got to experience me. You got to go through me. And if you go through me, then you know who God is. Don't worry, they didn't get it yet. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. This is right afterwards, the, right, the, the very next verse. Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Pause there for a second. This is where I was in my atheism. I felt like if God existed, man, why doesn't he just boom it out for everyone to know, to see, to touch, right? Then we would know. Jesus answered, don't you know me? Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I'm in the Father and that the Father is in me? Mm -hmm. And I think this is this is Jesus response to us is that you don't the, the, the heavens don't have to open and you have to look through a keyhole to see God. I've been among you this whole time. Yeah. How could you say that to me? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Can, you, can you feel the hurt? Like, this is it. It's the final countdown, baby. Yeah. And they're like, okay, hey, run past us. How, how are we with you forever? You know, why don't you just show us the Father? And, and he's like, guys, I'm not going to be with you. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, and he says, man, I've been with you such a long time. He's emphasizing knowing him in order to know God. I I told you to turn to Matthew 7. I'm going to deliver on that. But why is it important to know God? Because scriptures that scare you like this one. Matthew 7 verse 21. 
It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and your name drive out many demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Okay, let's theologically mess with this Rubik's Cube. How could Jesus not know you? How, how could he not know these people who use his name and use his power? And he, he say, it's not that he says, oh, you guys just didn't work hard enough. You guys just didn't do enough. He says, I never knew you. Not, well, we're just acquaintances. I never knew you. It's not only important to know God, but it's important for God to know you. He says, it's plain. It's easy. It's a simple judgment. I never knew you. Who are you? I don't know who you are. I think about my relationship with Susan. And Susan and I knew each other before we started dating. It wasn't like uh, eHarmony.com or something. Um, I, we, we met the old-fashioned way. Um, we, we created a friendship. We were great friends for a while. And, you know, and then, man, it, it just hit me where I thought, man, I really like this girl. I want to go after her. I know I have no shot because I'm shorter than her. <laughs> but it's worth the rejection. Yeah. It's worth it. I wasn't going to settle for a silver medal. I wanted Susan. And, uh, and, and, you know, it's just one of those things where, you know, I got to know Susan. And, you know, and I, I loved all the information I got about her. The more I knew, the more I fell in love with her, right? Um, and, and that information. And, you know, what happens if we led to our wedding day and, Je- and Susan would have been like, who are you? I don't know you, but it's not that only I had information, but I, I loved who Susan was. I loved that information, but what happens on the wedding day, she would have been like, I, I don't know who you are. I'm not going to marry you, wow. and I feel like that's kind of like what this moment would feel like for a lot of religious people who, who, who do a lot of actions, who do a lot of things in the name of Jesus, but don't ever really know him or experience him. Or, or God gets to experience them. And, and okay, I'm going to open a big door here and put on our big boy pants. Now that I'm 50, we'll do that. I'm going to refer to a Hebrew word here. My, my name's Hebrew, Benjamin, so uh, I'll talk about Hebrew. And uh, so the way you pronounce this word is yada. I know you want to say yada. Um, or, or, or it looks close to Yoda, um, for those who are nerdy in here. Um, and, and the way that I describe this term to you is, that, look, it's a Hebrew term commonly used in the Old Testament. We're going to talk about that in a second, meaning to know someone through experience. So I think we live in the age of Google right now, and it's easy to know a lot of things. Even with Alexa in our house, I can ask her, okay, how many grams are in a cup, Alexa? And she tells me, and now I know. And then I know it for like five seconds. And then when I need it again, I'm going to have to ask it again, right? Um, and, and so I think it's just one of those things of, look, we, we live in the age of knowledge. We call it that. Uh, we're in the information highway, right? I'm um, talking about the internet. No one calls it that anymore. But, um, but you know, it's this idea, but when you actually experience some of these things, like when they talk about the distance between the earth and the moon, But then you're that astronaut traveling that distance, and you experience that distance in the free floating, the absence of gravity, and you see the earth behind you. That's more of what I think God is talking about than knowing the distance between the earth and the moon. But this is how we're living out our relationship with God. Does that make sense? Logan said I was nerdy, and I'm I'm laying it down for you. So there's two points to this lesson. The first one is for us to experience God. How do we experience God? Old Testament, baby. Here we go. Um, Talking about this concept, but Jesus is constantly talking about this 
in his ministry and people are like walking away because of the hard things he says because you don't really know me anyway. You're not mine. So on and so forth. When it seems really harsh in the Gospels, but it's there in the Old Testament in every book you turn around in. But here I picked three of my, my favorites. So Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24. It says, this is what the Lord says. Let, n- let not the wise man boast of his wisdom or the strong man boast of his strength or the rich man boast of his riches, which I can't boast in any of those areas, but amen. But let him who boasts, boast that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who exercise kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. What does God want his people to boast about? How rich they are, how talented they are, how strong they are, how smart they are, how well, how well they're maneuvering through life, how loved they are, how many relationships they have, what degrees they have. No, he wants, God, he wants his people to boast about one thing, knowing me. And it's that word, you day. To experience me. I want you to boast about one thing, and that's your experience of me. To experience my kindness. Experience my justice. My righteousness. Will we experience God's character in our lives? You know, we always want to boast about, man, God's power and might. When God just does the impossible, right? Man, you've prayed this prayer. You've wanted something so badly. You pleaded with God, and then it happens. Let me describe this moment when Susan and I packed up from from Texas and moved here. I don't think I prayed more or fasted more that year um, about baptizing someone at OU. I thought, man, meant to experience God's power on this campus like we did in Denton or in Austin before. I wanted to experience God's power again. You know, and we had plenty of people come through the doors. You remember Kachi, um, uh, Sam, um, uh, uh, Rhett. Man, a lot of these guys we met, they came in, they loved the church, but, man, they didn't really want to know God. You know, they they left. But you remember Amber? Yeah. Hubbard? Yeah. My wife met her on campus. Just what we thought might have been just random, right? Man, and then Amber was our first OU student, yeah. you know, that made Jesus Lord and got baptized here. Come on. And, and I just think about, man, there, there's a lot of people in order, and, and, we, and it finally happened. The thing we've been praying for and fasting for, and it came in the picture of Amber. Yeah. And, and, and then not only Amber, but then Bernard, yeah. and then Jane, and then Addie, uh, and then David, um, and, and then Noah. Like, it, you know what? But Amber was the first, you know, and then she was graduating that very next semester, and I remember just tearing up and saying, this is why we came for people like you. You are why we came. That's awesome. And and she's like, okay, I'm going to cry. And and we cried together, but, um, you know, it's even one of those moments she got to graduate, her and Bernard got married that summer as disciples of Jesus. Um, You know, she's in medical school now, and Bernard is an engineer, and uh, (laughs) still doing awesome at that. But we got to see him at the marriage retreat three weekends ago. And not only was it that, but they had visitors with them. And we feel like, man, you know, it's just a flash in the pan of Amber's life. And man, and now here they're in Fort Worth, and now they're changing other people's lives. I, I mean, it's just like, man, God's power. All I asked was for us to make a disciple here, and th- but it's continuing. Man, God's power is continually being experienced. And it's nice when I'm not always in the mix of it, right? I get to come back two years later, and they're talking about people that they're studying the Bible with and those experiences. God wants us to boast in that. Man, when we experience God's power, man, His might. Go to Hosea uh, Hosea chapter 2. Or just jump with me in light speed like this. (laughs) And God uses the same word to know, the yade, uh, with the same word to betroth in Hosea. I will betroth you to me forever. 
I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge the Lord. Betroth. It's the same word that God used there in Jeremiah 9. It's the same word in Hosea, just translated in English a little differently. Uh, to, to know and experience was also used for their word in marriage. To know someone. To know God like a spouse. And, and knowing your spouse is it's not like appliances. It doesn't work that way. You know what I mean? It, it's a relationship. There's some very finite things about those relationships and who we marry. But we choose to love and grow and mature and experience life together. This is Old Testament, you know what I mean? Right. And God's pouring out his heart to his people. They're constantly turning away. Jeremiah 31. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time. And this is a prophecy of us being in the kingdom of God, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds. I will write it in their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No, no longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, know the Lord, your day. Because they will all know me, your day. The least of them to the greatest. He's talking about, I'm going to create a kingdom where everyone's going to know me, like a marriage. Everyone is going to experience me it's going to be different it's going to be a new covenant and that's what jesus was opening up the door for everyone's going to know god everyone's going to know him from the least in the kingdom to the greatest everyone is going to experience god not just the high priest not just moses not just abraham having these bible experiences but you and me Everyone is going to have these experiences with God. But it's nice to boast about God's power and might. But how about when God, when we experience his character and his righteousness? Who here has ever been disciplined by God? If you don't raise your hand, you will. Double hands. Uh, and... Man, it's, it's not just, yeah, we're going to take the hill and, and every prayer is going to be answered all the time. But it's not just his power, but man, to experience God's character, right. his righteousness, his justice in your life. When we're not willing to put it in our lives, he forces it in sometimes. I think about a sales job I took in New York as a sophomore in college at the time. And uh, man, and I blew up my first week. I was 16th in the company and best on my sales team my first week. Second week, I didn't do so well. Well, I, I pretty much did the same, but people just did a little bit better the next week. They got better, and I didn't. Um, and, and so I went from 16th, and then I was 31. But I was still best in my sales group, right? And then I slowly started to drop each week more and more. And, and, uh, and we we're doing sales, and we had so many calls you had to do, how many demos you had with people talking about the product. And, and I remember I made the decision I was going to lie about my stats. Not, you know what I mean? I, I get paid on commission, so it's not like I earn more money that way. But I thought, I'm just going to lie about my stats. And, and like that, I did it. Now, as a baby Christian at the time, I just became a Christian. But it's just one of those moments where I just lied really quickly to make my managers, you know, think that I'm, I'm, still, do, I'm still working just as hard. Yeah. And then it hit me. I was like, ah, man, I lied. And, uh, and so I made the decision I was going to be open with them. Hey, I'm sorry. I lied about my stats. So I got open. They're like, wow, okay. Uh, we kind of suspected, uh, but you know, man, you know, to experience God's justice at that time, right? Man, God could have really disciplined me, I, and I, I wish to tell you that I became the best salesman again. That's not how the story ends. In fact, I lose my job over time, um, and, and I go back home, honestly, with my head down. I was really sad. 
um, you know, about the job there. But, you know, but some of the experience was that three guys on my sales team all studied the Bible. My manager studied the Bible, and so did his boss. Yeah. I, I mean, it's just like one of those moments about I experienced God's character, God's righteousness, but at the same time, he was still moving. You know what I mean? Like, despite, it wasn't about how awesome I am. And I think that's how I feel about being in ministry. God didn't put me in the ministry because I'm awesome, but I can be an example of how screwed up someone can be and yet still experience God, like have amazing memories of God. How's your experience of God been lately? How about your memories with him, his power? His righteousness, His character. Have you been dodging it? Not trying to experience it? How about experiencing God's grace, God's love, compassion? For me, I think about when I studied the Bible. Man, when I get brutally honest with brothers in my life, right? And then all of a sudden, right? Man, through confession, through repentance, I get to experience God's love and grace. When I think a lot of times our experience with God is sold as worship. Just sing your heart out and you're going to feel God's grace. When I think that's not really what scriptures talk about. Man, God's talking about humbling yourself. How about your experience of God's grace? God's love. God wants us to experience all aspects of his character. Even the scary ones. (laughs) He wants us to experience everything about him. And maybe you're saying, you know, that, that's this church's experience. And that's what I love about this church. Everyone has a lot of these stories. Yeah. And it's encouraging. But maybe you feel like, yeah, okay, a lot of people in my church have that experience. Or in my small group, people have that, those experiences. Um, but I don't. Yeah. Or not lately. And perhaps it's because you're lacking the faith to step out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. To experience God's character. Mm-hmm. You guys picking up what I'm putting down? Yeah. Yes, sir. Let's talk about how God experiences us. Okay. Come on. Come on We're going to go there. You knew that. I told you. Yeah. Let's talk about how God experiences us. Yeah. Matthew chapter 7. So back there again. This is the scripture right after the one we read before. It says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Not Dwayne Johnson. (laughs) The rain came down. Think about this. Think about if you're in your house and the rain just starts pouring down, doesn't stop. The floodwaters start to rise. Up the street, into your yard, up the steps, onto your floor. Like, oh, we're going to have to get on top of this piece, right? I mean, and get in the attic, get on the roof. The water's rising. But at the same time, the wind's hitting too. Streams rose, the winds blew, and you're being against that house. What a scary moment to be in, right? Yet it doesn't fall. What happens if you're on that house and it falls? Man, you see, the same experience comes up. Man, it's getting scarier and scarier. And you're like, oh, please, God, don't let this house fall from under me. It's all because it had a foundation on the rock. It's our obedience is how God experiences us. Not just knowing the word, not just knowing Jesus' stats on the field, right? Um, And all his highlights and all his miracles. It's not just a knowledge about him, but to experience him. And this is how God experienced us through obedience. He says, hey, you build it on the rock by putting it into practice is how you put it on the rock. The man who put it on the sand just listened to the words and didn't obey. The difference between that house hanging on and falling apart is obedience. Jesus didn't know them because of their obedience. You know what? I know know you by name. I'm Jesus. I know a lot of stats. I know how many demons you drove out. I know how many miracles you performed. I know how much you've given to church. You sacrificed your time. I know your stats, but I never experienced you. I never knew you. 
Here's that moment in John 14. We read this earlier. Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him and he will come to him and, and, and make our home with him. It's, look, if anyone loves me, obey. This is how I experience you. It's not Jesus is my homeboy. It's, of course, God knows you. He knows what you're going through, but he wants to experience your character. Yeah, I know. I know what you're going through. I know you by name. I know how many hairs are on your head. Do you know that? God knows that. God knows more about us than we know. It's not that he doesn't know, but God wants to experience us. And Jesus is trying to lay that down in the time of Pharisees and teachers of the law who built more on knowledge and more on you know, the letter of the law rather than experience of obedience. Just obey me. They struggled to just obey Jesus' teachings. Here's this moment in Genesis with Abraham. And God's words here in the Old Testament. I mean, this moment changes the Old Testament. When Abraham takes his son Isaac, the promise of 25 years was finally delivered. Ten years later or so, God asked for him to sacrifice that son. Yeah, Hebrews says that Abraham reasoned that he was going to kill his son, but God was going to raise him from the dead. Man, talk about a crazy place to be in. Abraham did not experience that any of his time on earth. He never saw anyone raised from the dead. He, he had a lot of experiences of God doing awesome things, but he never saw that. Right. And, he, and he's on the mountain there, and he, he's, he's about to put the knife through Isaac. Not the best Bible story time for your kids, right? <laughs> and uh, Abraham raised his hand. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Good night, kids. Uh, we'll pick it up tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the moment where he raises the knife, right? It says, do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know, ye day, that you fear God. It was, did God not know that? Couldn't he just crunch the numbers and know that Abraham would just would have done it without asking? Yeah. Yeah, he could have. But he wanted to ye day. He wanted to experience Abraham, experience the obedience. How could, how could Jesus ever say, I never knew you? How could he say that? He, he never you dayed. He never experienced your obedience. You know the difference of when you make a decision off what the Bible says? Oh, man. It's one of the greatest feelings on the planet, I feel yeah, like. When you're like, you read it in the Word and you're like, that's it. I'm doing it. I'm taking that step of faith right here. Uh, you know, it, it's going to happen. And I think that's that moment when God's like, I found that lost sheep, right? Man, he's experiencing us. We're ro- rejoicing together. The angels are, man, are roaring up. They're like, yeah, baby, let's go. Let's do that. You know, and then that moment comes and our heart is beeping, beating. You know, oh, yeah, here it's coming. And, and, you know, we get all sweaty and nervous, and then we obey. Yeah. It happens. Yeah. And, and, no, the heavens don't open up um, <laughs> and say, well done, good and faithful servant. But the Spirit roars, yeah. right? Yeah. Man, the Spirit He placed inside of us. And I think it's just, man, it's just one of the greatest feelings in the world when God uses you. Yeah. Yeah. Man, God uses you, me. God wanted to experience the earth, not just create an, an ant farm experience here and run some lab tests. God wanted to experience the earth through us more than anything else, through our obedience. Oh, man, I, I went too far. And, and this is how I wanted to encourage the church today. Um, and just in the level of, look, know God. Yeah. Aim to know him, his character, his power, his might. But it's going to require you to step out on faith. 
It's going to require you to make decisions off what the Bible teaches. And you're the one. You're going to have to take the scary step. No one can make that step for you. You can't delegate that to anyone else. And God is so looking forward to that moment. God wants to experience you this week. And he wants you to experience him. When we come back from midweek on Wednesday and church on Sunday, let's boast about the experiences we had and how God worked in our lives. And maybe it's not the, the hey moment of, man, just all those outward signs. Maybe it's those inward things as well. Boast about them. Talk about your God in that capacity of that. Man, I, I get to know God and experience God in this life. Here's our chance to do it, church. Let's know God and let God know us. To God be the glory. Amen.